Greetings, I'm Dave Gilmore, and this is Design Intelligence. Chris Allen is Global Principal at Jacobs, a purpose-led technical professional services firm with approximately $16 billion in annual revenue and a talent force of more than 60,000 people. He works collaboratively with partners and clients to co-create and align innovative technologies, practices, and business models to deliver economic, environmental, and social benefits through high-performance, sustainable, regenerative solutions. On this edition of This Is Design Intelligence, he talks about balancing optimism with the reality of the complex environmental challenges, why the UN SDG framework doesn't have to be specific to be effective, and how Jacobs continues to adapt and evolve by adding diversity in collaborators and points of view. Welcome to this edition of This is Design Intelligence, conversations with leadership voices in the built environment. Thank you for joining me, Chris Allen, here on This is Design Intelligence. It is a wonderful context to be able to, to have this time with you. I appreciate the invite, Dave. Excited to cover this topic with you and share some stories and also learn from you. I don't think that many people know who Chris Allen is out in the big world because I think you're just wonderfully humble, but uh, it's, it's extraordinary your career and what you've been putting into. So many people are so enthused about joining the sustainability movement and, and applying their their world. And here you have been at this, I think, around 34, 35 years at this point. So you are a veteran in the space, that's for sure. And the organization you work for at Jacobs is putting its finger and its foot in many areas of expression around environmental responsibility. It's pretty special. When you look at the state of the world today, when you look at where we are from an environmental standpoint, what comes to mind? What are you thinking these days, Chris? Well, there's room for optimism for sure, but there's also some really large, complex challenges that we're facing now in the foreseeable future. So uh, on the one hand, I'm really excited by the the enthusiasm and the innovation, particularly of the younger generation coming behind us, and also some of the the new political will that we're seeing to to tackle these challenges and to see how important and uh, well beyond important imperative it is for us to get this right <laughs> for our future generation. So on the one hand, that's that's giving me optimism. Uh, on the other hand, the the size, complexity, and scale of the challenges uh, ahead of us are often very daunting and um, just almost take my breath away sometimes when I look deeply into them. So it's, it's a bit of a mixed back yeah. in that front. And that's, that's really my daily reality, Dave, is, is trying to balance the, the optimism with the, the reality of the complexity and the, and the, the absolute in-our-face problem uh, daily that we face. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're so inclined towards immediacies and instant gratification. And this is not an immediacy nor instant gratification dynamic. What we have created over decades is now coming home. And it will take decades to honestly resolve this problem. And that is only if we find unity in our approaches to addressing this global crisis. That's absolutely right. And from my view, a lot of the, the technology that we have and the, uh, the brilliant minds to work on the technical side of this are really coming to the fore and, and uh, uh, really driving a lot of exciting innovation. I think where we're really struggling the most is, is around that unity and also developing the, the political will to take on a challenge that's it's going to be disruptive. It's going to require a wholesale reimagination of a lot of our infrastructure and large social and economic systems that are in order to be able to do this over the generations to come. So it's, to your point, it's that unity, political will, vision, and long-term thinking that's required that, uh, that, that we really have to develop that's, that's uh, right now, frankly, an obstacle that we have to surmount. At Design Intelligence, we were so delighted and pleased when your chairman and CEO uh, led from the front a few years ago by putting some statements in and some stakes in the ground about what Jacobs would start being, what Jacobs would do uh, going forward, even though you'd, you'd been doing many things. It was like you folks were doubling down on 
environmental responsibility, not only for your own firm and the work and the footprint that you do, but looking at every opportunity in every project to extend these truths and these convictions about the future of the world and what your work that you folks do could do to contribute to turning this thing around. I, it was extraordinary to see such a dramatic and conviction-based um, commitment to the future. That's absolutely right. It's really exciting and motivating for so many of us you know, that work at Jacobs to, to have that uh, absolute top-level commitment to sustainability and, and particularly the sustainable development goals from the United Nations. We found a way to, to use that framework to translate that into very clear, articulated business objectives for the company so that we can begin to, to basically shift all of our solutions and all of our thinking towards integrating sustainable development goals into everything we touch, everything we do, because we know that that's what's going to be required to, to solve the challenges, uh, meet the magnitude of the problems, and, and do this really in, in a systems thinking way. It can be argued that a, a lot of the problems that we face or, or, or a lot of the impediments is, is what we call siloed thinking. It's, it's trying to solve things with a single lens. And, and what we at Jacobs have, have determined is that we have to look at this across our solutions. We have to think, think in an integrated way. And when we look at the sustainable development goals, all 17 of them, that's what it really requires because all of the, the problems have an environmental, social, economic dimension require political will, require innovation, re require collaboration at unprecedented levels. So that framework and that type of thinking was very inspiring for us in, in developing kind of six real clear you know, business objectives around meeting those, those sustainable development goals. And they, you know, they cover really critical things like health and well-being of society is, is, is kind of first and foremost, you know, putting people first, uh, looking at global water and the sanitation crisis, which is so critical around the world, and and Jacob says a really strong solution set and and uh, history around that. Uh, you know, developing this culture of technology and innovation, which is really going to be the, uh, important as we we think about a society that can take on this challenge in the future. How do we become technologically proficient and have an innovation mindset that's just continuous? And also thinking about you know social equity and inclusion and how important that is, so that we don't uh, in in our innovations you know create more social injustice, marginalize societies, marginalize communities, and then really how do we begin to think about you know the metrics around this as we're developing approaches? How can we drive towards net gains and environmental, social, economic indicators that really can help us calibrate? our solutions, uh, you know, drive towards the, the sustainable development goals in really measurable ways. And then last and, and, and not least is the climate, you know, the climate emergency really. So how do we really focus on that as, as a cornerstone of what we do? We are major fans and promoters of the SDGs. It is interesting to me uh, how uh, maybe it's maybe it's what's in vogue these days that everything is assailable, but there's been so many negative statements made about the the sustainable development goals, and I I'm really quite fed up with it to be honest with you. There's a, there it is such a solid framework. It is advanced forward. Not everything advances at the same rate, but welcome to humanity. But at the end of the day, the framework, if it's adopted as a way to action your convictions, it is tremendous. And if more and more within the built environment industry would say, hey, enough with the criticisms, here's the framework, let's put ourselves into this to advance this forward, like Jacobs has done, it would be just world changing, to be honest with you. Totally agree. And we really see that, uh, uh, you know, as a North Star, it, it doesn't have, you know, the criticism, as you, as you well know, you know, lack specificity and all that stuff. But it, really what we need is a global North Star that we can all begin to drive forwards toward. And, and that that specificity and the real technical details, that, that comes in the doing and the building over time. But I, having that common vision, having that North Star is really what's going to drive the unity that you talked about earlier. And then when we get into the technical programming, we get to putting those on the ground. That's when we can have that level of specificity, the metrics, the you know all the other pieces that are absolutely going to have to come in place. But I, that's not really what the SDG framework is for. It's, it's really to set that high-level North Star and bar by which companies 
organizations can drive towards these common goals together. So totally agree with you, Dave. So, uh, so here we are, uh, we're talking about Jacobs, we're talking about your work within Jacobs and your many colleagues and peers that you work with around the world. Uh, what is it, you know, that, that really drives the spirit of Jacobs in this dynamic of responsible design solutions around the world. There, there has to be something going on at the core of your being as an organization that has, that has caused this. You know, anybody that wants to take a, a, a look at Jacobs.com, you're going to find this isn't like a, a tab over to the side. <laughs> this is like everywhere across your, uh, the way you communicate with the outside world. Far too often we see it as, oh, it's just another thing that we do. This is the thing that you do, is that it's at the heart of all of the work around the world. What is that that's driving that within your organization? Because it's unusual, to be honest with you. Yes, um, it's really a purpose-led company, and, that, and that's what attracted me to Jacobs to begin with. Uh, you know, Jacobs acquired CH2M Hill about six years ago. And I think it was during that acquisition that this uh, this idea of, of a purpose-led company of the future and a company like no other is really driving the culture towards you know, sustainability as a not only a, as a mandate for for a company of this size to be able to you know drive uh, good outcomes in the world, but also that marrying that with good business practices is really a winning strategy. And it's a winning strategy because it's, one, going to drive innovation, which is absolutely necessary for engineering and solutions in the 21st century. But also, it's very important for attracting the talent that's going to be needed to solve these challenges in the 21st century. And, and young people are, are very excited about the idea of a company of this side that is purpose-led, that is building a sustainability culture that can take on this from a not just a business perspective, but also from a societal responsibility and, and doing good with your career perspective that really motivates a lot of people, m myself included. And so, you know, having a company that has that set of values is, is, uh, creates a lot of energy within the company, but also is, is, uh, that energy and that excitement is also infectious with clients, right? Bringing that passion to your work really spills over in clients. And that motivation is really good business for us as well as we're helping Clients deal with some very, very difficult challenges. Um, having that purpose-led value set really helps carry the day as well. You used to be involved. I think you actually led biomimicry, what is today called 3.8, uh, years ago. And Jacobs continues to be a partner in that organization. And it is um, a tremendous what's been achieved uh, there. And uh, I'm guessing that Jacobs is partnering with many organizations around the world because it's never a, it, it never can be done alone. And so you're seeing all kinds of partnerships that kind of extend the the influence of Jacobs in this core conviction around the world. Do you, can you speak about any of any of those things? Sure, I'll I'll start with the you know the partnership with Biomimicry 3.8. Uh, that's a particularly exciting one for me because, as you know, Dave, I was formerly the CEO of Biomimicry 3.8 before joining Jacobs. But that particular company is at the forefront of sustainability innovation, in my opinion, because of what it's really doing is drawing upon 3.8 billion years of ecological intelligence <laughs> that's, that allows designers, planners, innovators, um, cross-the-board disciplines to draw into the wisdom of the natural world and how the natural world has adapted and evolved over, you know, eons. And, and that is the information that, that we need to be able to tap and utilize and deploy in order to get to the solutions that are going to be truly sustainable. When we look to, to the natural world is all kinds of models that we can replicate, that we can study that are go going to need to be the materials, the chemistries, the building structures, the um, uh, the climate models of the future, because that's what's really going to ground us in in good science. So that particular partnership, uh, we're doing some amazing work with uh, on data centers and buildings and infrastructure projects uh, with that company around the world. But there's uh, just a range of partners that we're that we're able to work with, you know, from from micro business to small and, and medium enterprises that are bringing that really specific. Uh, skill set, innovation, uh, knowledge networks, and tools that are helping a big company like ours, you know, diversify and 
uh, I, my opinion is that it's going to require an innovation ecosystem of companies of all sizes and, and organizations of all types working together, collaborating to be able to solve these, these really large scale challenges. Jacobs alone can't do it. You know, we're a company of 60,000 people, but uh, we have to collaborate. We have to find new ways of thinking. We have to keep adapting and evolving as an organization and, and the inputs from small businesses and other organization partners absolutely imperative for that. And I hope our audience is listening to this. You know, you often say, well, it's Jacobs. They're they're gargantuan. They're the 800-pound gorilla. They'll just do it all. What are they going to want to work with me for? Or if they do work with me, they'll take over. And what I'm hearing is that's not the case. We're here to partner with you, and we're here to do these things together because, as you said, it takes an ecosystem, not an individual organism, to get this work done. And there's a really interesting biological analogy I like to use on that, kind of using the, the biomimicry lens, is that we know in the natural world that, that monocultures, uh, a single stand of an organism, is, is quite brittle and not resilient over time. We know that, that uh, systems that, that have a lot of diversity in them are much more resilient. They're much more robust, and it, it is that diversity within a system that allows it to adapt and evolve and thrive over time. So the more that Jacobs uh, continues to adapt and evolve by adding diversity of companies, sizes, organizations, collaborators, points of view, all that stuff is going to strengthen uh, the Jacobs internal ecosystem and also allow us to perform it at uh, really new types of exciting levels with our clients and w within the geographies and economies we work around the world. So that diversity biomimicry is a really, uh, really key uh, metaphor for me. So we often say that the built environment is hands down the largest single industry in the world. Now it's made up of a of a, uh, a community of industries, if we can put it that way, and disciplines. But if you think about it, from the time we're born, at least in the Western world, from the time we're born to the time we pass, we're moving from building to building to building. Everything is moving from a dwelling, from a, from a hospital to a home to a school, et cetera, et cetera, through our lives. And the work, the particular uh, work at Jacobs under the built environment, and I'm talking about uh, design and construction, uh, space of dwellings, buildings where people are. It seems to have have made its largest negative impact in the world uh, through carbon emissions coming out of buildings, right? And, uh, you know, you look at the ranges of stuff. I'm not sure when the latest study has been done on carbon uh, as far as where the sources are. But of course, at one time it was 38, then it was 40, then it was 42%. So I'm going to call it 38 to 42% of of carbon emissions are coming from buildings, as is, 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 is often stated. So two things, do you believe that? And number two, um, how does this work that you're doing get directly translated into that context as opposed to infrastructure, water systems, uh, tunnels, bridges, dynamics? Yeah, on the, on the buildings front, I, that's that's clear. I think the data is there that that sector, everything from the, you know, the, the operational carbon, but also the embedded carbon in the in the building industry is just a tremendous, you know, impact on, on climate. And so that's a paradigm, a system, and an economy around the world that, as we were talking earlier in this session, what what a gigantic, complex challenge to try to basically transform the the AEC industry towards low and eventually no carbon emissions. That's that's a very daunting, multi-decade task, but it's one we're going to have to do because we have to have buildings, we have to have infrastructure to go along with the buildings. And so, you know, the frameworks that are now working towards, you know, net zero buildings, uh, net zero building performance, again, not only in the operational carbon, but also in the embedded carbon, that's what's going to drive the innovation. That's what's going to drive the investment. You know, the, the absolute requirement that the building industry decarbonize, it, it's huge, it's massive. Uh, it, and it's really, in my opinion, non-negotiable going forward in the, in the decades to come. Some of the work that we're doing that's, uh, you know, related to that, that I think is kind of the, the the longer term thinking is, and this is again, a biomimicry framing is that, as you mentioned, Dave, a lot of the buildings that we see now are liabilities on the landscape. Let's call them net negative when we think about them in the ecological context, in the climate context. How do we turn that around and begin to think about the things that we build as 
assets on the landscape. And that's, that's using the biomimicry metaphor. If we, if we think about the things that we build and that we design can actually be net producers of ecosystem services, that means that the buildings can actually sequester carbon. The buildings can provide facades that are, that, that support biodiversity. The buildings and their, their associated infrastructure can actually polish water and send water back into the, into the aquifers. That's the kind of thinking that, that needs to, to shift from you know, buildings as, again, net negative performers on the landscape. They're, they're great for the actual services that they provide for housing people and offices and whatnot. But what if we extended that value to say, well, buildings can actually perform ecosystem services if we design them correctly? That's a real new framing that's pretty exciting. And we've been doing some really amazing work with a number of companies. I, I'm not going to name names here, but uh, large automotive manufacturers gigantic users of data centers that are very interested in this idea because one, it's going to drive down their environmental footprint and two, it's going to begin to help position them as driving a range of community benefits in the things that they build. And so that that kind of paradigm shift and its long-term implications are, are something that we're really actively promoting at Jacobs. It just seems like it's like common sense, you know, at the end of the day. And so does it does it require some kind of regulatory mandate that says, listen, going forward, every building is going to go up. It's got to be done this way. And every building that's already in existence, we got to figure out a plan to move them to this type of biomimicry-based imaging for just the pragmatism of what you just stated. Or is it voluntary on the part of every developer to say, this is what we want to do. Now help us pencil this out financially so that it doesn't, you know, mess us up. How do we approach the pragmatism of this as opposed to the goodwill? Because I'm, I'm getting less and less enamored with human goodwill these days. And sometimes I'm thinking we just need to say, ladies and gentlemen, this has to be done. I, I agree. And I think the, you know, the policy frameworks that are going to drive this eventually are, are starting to, to, to come together. There's a, an exciting new development from the GSA, uh, the Government Services Administration, that's, that's building into their P100 design guidelines the need to consider ecosystem services in all the projects. And if you think about GSA as one of the world's largest real estate owners, those kind of implications are really, really strong signals to the market that this thinking is starting to mature and that uh, policy interventions like that are going to have a dramatic effect you know, over the coming years uh, uh, along those lines. Same with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They're starting to require ecosystem services thinkings in large civil projects. So I think those regulatory frameworks are starting to emerge to drive this. And then the, the more that we have project proofs of how these this can work at the data center level, this can work in a corporate master plan for new facilities, this can work in a new regional healthcare facility, those project proofs begin to take away some of the, the barriers and the not possible <laughs> uh, statements that are sometimes, you know, hindrances to, to, to building these into projects. So I think combination of regulatory pressure you know, the technical programming and the project proofs are all starting to emerge as saying that this is possible and that, that uh, th there's some hope there that this can actually uh, begin to happen. It's fantastic. Now, you travel around the world and the work that you do as a senior consultant advising uh, clients and governments and entities all over around this set of themes that you and I have been discussing. When you look at the global geographies, who do you think around the world is is best accelerating environmental responsibilities? Uh, again, also with the SDG front of mind, social impact, positive, uh, responsible economic impact. So it's never one thing, right? It's a bundle. Who's Who's taken this stuff seriously? Can you give us some examples of places where it's really being done well? You know, I'm I'm really excited about the the you know uh, the UK's new uh, net gain in biodiversity legislation. That's going to be a tremendous policy lever. To, and we were just speaking about policy, but you know that's it's early days on that, and it's it's not perfect, and it's you know meeting some controversy. But that type of legislation saying that all new developments um, have to be able to demonstrate a net gain in biodiversity in your development project. That's a huge market signal, a huge challenge to developers and, and builders to actually do that. But that type of forward thinking, uh, progressive legislation and the 
uh, the can-do spirit of the companies and our team and, the, and Jacobs that are rolling up their sleeves to try to figure out how we're going to get this, how we're going to meet meet this new uh, emerging legislation. Super inspiring. Same with the EU, some of the, the legislation, some of the the really progressive financial sector players there that are driving you know new business models and investment structures for the natural world to incorporate biodiversity and nature-based solutions and how those are funded, how those are integrated into large infrastructure projects. Same in Australia, a lot of new, super exciting legislation going on there. As I mentioned here in the United States, the, the GSA, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, some really great stuff going on there. Also in Singapore, I think Singapore, from an urban design perspective and what they're doing with things like green stormwater infrastructure, nature-based solutions for coastal resilience, urban design to mitigate heat island effects, you know, integrating nature and, and nature-based solutions for that. Some really, you know, really fantastic work being done there, and and when you put all that together, uh, it, it really you can really start to see some some great scale of investments, some really almost leapfrogging and in technological innovation at the urban scale that is is really exciting for me. Yeah, that very much is. Uh, Jacobs has many, uh, you know, I would call highlight projects around the world that are going on right now. I, one that I am particularly interested in uh, here in the United States is what's happening in San Francisco, your participation in the San Francisco Waterfront Resilience Program that's that's going on there. You know, if anybody wants to know about that, you just simply need to go out and put San Francisco Waterfront Resilience Program into Google. It, it may take you there. It may take you to a Jacob site, but they, um, it's a, it's a, it is a gargantuan task to be taken on, but it's being taken on to to look at a hundred year old seawall infrastructure that's no longer it's not going to continue to be viable. We're watching sea level rise that is predicted by I think it's 2040, 2050. It's going to be up an, another two or three feet, uh, which really creates a, a dramatic change on the waterfront if these things aren't mitigated and understood. And then it directly impacts the built environment in a significant way from when it comes to buildings and construction. A fantastic participation. You're doing that with many partners and, and collaborating in that. What other types of projects would you highlight for us today where you're seeing this coalescence come together that you folks are in the center of? Yeah, in addition to the, the Waterfront Resilience Program, which is just a massive opportunity, challenge, uh, exciting set of partners you know, coming together there, led by the, the Port of San Francisco and, and their long-term vision. Another one that I'm very excited about is the work that we've done at Tyndall Air Force Base. This was uh, started after Hurricane Michael pretty much destroyed the entire Air Force Base. And to the Air Force's credit, they said, when we build this Air Force Base back, we want to build the, the Air Force Base of the future and really demonstrate from a sustainability and resilience perspective what can be done when we think about new approaches, new technologies, new ways of, of thinking about you know, massive infrastructure that would support uh, an Air Force base. And one of the programs there that's particularly exciting is the uh, Coastal Resilience Program, which is now has a range of, of partners working regionally to validate and, and to collaborate on approach that's really relying a lot on nature-based solutions as what we call the first line of defense in, in storms of the future. So this is requiring a whole array of nature-based solutions from dune restorations to oyster reefs to offshore sediment placement to a, a range of other ecological green stormwater infrastructure type features that are all working together as a single system to help that base be able to resist and be resilient to storms of the future. And it's a massive undertaking as part of a, a base redevelopment. But one of the most exciting parts for me too is just again the regional collaboration, the the partners that have come forward from the Nature Conservancy, from the local government, local and regional governments, the University of Florida. I can't list all the partners here because there's so many of them, but that array of collaboration saying, hey, we we have an opportunity here to really experiment and innovate at scale, and we as partners want to work together and try to help the Air Force figure this out, not only on the base but in the entire region, because the implications of Using this type of technology, using this type of innovation at this scale has implications not only in that part of Florida, in the Panama City Beach area, but across coastal Florida, across other geographies in the United States where nature-based solutions is a critical 
approach to coastal resilience, uh, uh, climate responses, it, it, the scale of that project is really inspiring to me. We, we're so encouraged and honored that you uh, took the time to spend these moments with us. Uh, before we go, Chris, what parting charge would you have to our listeners about the future and what we should what we should be putting ourselves into? It's a great question, Dave. For me, it's about the next and upcoming generations. First, thinking about them. <laughs> holding them in our hearts and minds because they're going to be inheriting a set of complex challenges that we're just now getting our heads around. So how do we, in, in our generation, in our, the rest of our careers, how do we do what we can to make a contribution towards those solutions that will create some momentum for future generations? And then how do we empower, support, encourage offer hope and resources to the generations that are going to come that are going to have to inherit and solve this during their lifetimes. So it's that really that multi-generational, intergenerational thinking and support that, uh, that's where I am in my career that's really gets me going and keeps me going every day, thinking about m my daughter, uh, thinking about uh, if she has children of the future, other families, other kids uh, around the world that's, that are going to be faced with some really, really difficult uh, climate challenges, social uh, related social challenges, related economic challenges. How do we, how do we set them up for success in, in the remaining parts of our careers? Thank you so much, Chris Allen. What an honor to be with you here today. And I don't think we're done. I think you and I'll have to do this again sometime to pick up on some more salient themes about the work that you and Jacobs are doing. Thank you, Dave. I look forward to it, and uh, really appreciate all the work Design and Challenges is, is doing to promote these kind of ideas and anything we can do to collaborate in the future. Really excited to do it. Thank you for joining us for this edition of This is Design Intelligence. The producer is Laura Spells. The sound engineer is Jared Knabel. This has been a DI Media Group production.